Welcome to Elevation Online. We are so glad that you've joined us today. In Philippians, Paul says that every time he remembers them, he gives thanks to God. And here at Elevation, we want you to know that that's how we feel. When we think of you, when we remember you, we give thanks to God. And he also says in those verses that he longs to be with them. And as he longs to be with them, this is the prayer that he has for them. And this is what we honestly pray for you that are watching today. We pray that your love may abound more and more and that you will grow in your knowledge and depth of insight. And that is honestly our prayer for you today. And we've got a great service coming up for you. We're going to worship together and then we're going to hear an incredible message from our lead pastor, Ross Abraham. And it's a message directly for your location. But you know, also in these verses, he says this, he says that I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. And so I just want to take a moment to thank each and every one of you that partner with us in sharing the gospel through your giving to Elevation Church. You know, it's because of your giving, your tithes and your offerings that we can reach the communities around us with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And actually through Elevation Online, we can reach to the ends of the earth with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we want to thank you for your partnership in that. And if you want to be part of that, you can just follow the directions on the screen. You can go to elevationchurch.com.au or you can give via the generous app. But whatever way you give, we appreciate it and we want to thank you. So let's worship. Rise, my soul, remember this, He took my sin and He buried it, no longer I who live, now Jesus lives in me.
desperation I turn to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished and the end is written Jesus Christ my living
Elevation Gold Coast, so great to be with you today. Uh, before I jump into uh, the word, can I just let you know two things? Uh, firstly, uh, uh, As and Beck Hamilton, who are so much part of the, the, the fabric of our church here, have accepted the role as service pastors at our Redlands location. And so the last two weeks, As and Beck have been up there on a Sunday um, and they'll be facilitating the service on the Sundays. They'll still be with us midweek. I work with Beck. We're not losing her in that space. But on a Sunday, that's where their energy is going. And we're so excited. It's not a, a, a loss. It's a, it's a seed sown for us because they believe that this could be part of their future. And, and it's really a great uh, opportunity for them to test the waters. And so uh, keep praying for As and Beck and for our Redlands family family and what God's going to do there. And the second thing is to let you know about uh, who were our Redlands location pastors. Isaac and Sophie Lenton are joining us and have joined us here at the Gold Coast. Isaac will be on staff, um, part of the team here as our young adults leader. Uh, phenomenal young couple, phenomenal young men, a great speaker, great leader, uh, love these guys so, so much. And so join with me in embracing them on their new season with us here at the Gold Coast. And it's going to be absolutely fantastic. Next week, as we talk about seasons, Brad spoke about it last week, you know, the next season of us here at the Gold Coast, we're going to be looking at what an emotionally healthy church looks like. Um, I'm going to teach on the theology around that uh, from Scripture. And uh, I'm really excited. It'll take the next few weeks for us to work through that. We're not in a hurry. Um, it's part of the new me, not being in too big a hurry. And I'm really excited about it. What does it actually look like for us to, to walk through? And as I spoke on last week, not, not stay emotional infants, therefore not spiritually mature, but so that we can spiritually, emotionally, physically uh, grow the way God wants us to grow. So let me give you, uh, as we launch in for today, a couple of the big rocks from last weekend, just in case that you, you never got to hear it. Okay, I still encourage you to grab the podcast. Uh, but if you, if you couldn't and can't, let me give you the big rocks. Basically, I gave a little bit of my journey this year where I hit a bit of a wall emotionally and spiritually and just spiritually felt so empty. And, and, and God has been almost like rebuilding my life in so many areas and re-educating and retraining my thinking. And, and let me tell you, to change the way you have been for 20, 40, 60 years is nothing short of a revolution. And I could honestly stand before you today and feel like God is doing a revolution in my own life in, in every aspect. I'm loving it and hating it. Uh, it's one of those, those dual tensions. But, but I talked about how, how for years I had been taught if you attend church, if you connect with people, if you serve, then you automatically should grow. But the problem with that is, is that I know as it is, was for me, probably is for you, that has never guaranteed growth spiritually. And we still find just as many burnt out people. And I was one of them that I, I, I've probably attended more church services, more conferences, sung more praise and worship than anyone else in Elevation, almost combined. And yet I have still felt totally dry, totally empty and spiritually blah. We talked about that. I, I made this statement that emotional health and spiritual maturity are inseparable. Paul spoke about this in 1 Corinthians 3. It is not possible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. And this is the journey that we want to go on to, to, to move us beyond being people who are 50 years of age. And yet when something doesn't work out for us, we revert back to this immature state of the tantrums and, and well, I'm leaving the church or I'm leaving my marriage or I'm quitting my job and these emotional reactions that have caused so much pain. And we want to grow spiritually and emotionally mature people. And then another thing I said was that we need a trellis to help us grow. A trellis is, is the exterior. It's the external framework for an internal journey. And it's what a vineyard would use to lift the fruit off the ground, because if it stayed on the ground, the, the fruit, it would grow rotten, to lift the fruit off the ground to become this mature 
fruit. And so what we need, and Jesus spoke about this in John chapter 15 and abiding in him, is a trellis so that the vine can grow up and the branches, which is us, can go out from the vine and bear much fruit. And so the trellis represents a structure. It represents a schedule, a set of practices that undergird our life with Jesus. And the critical issue on the journey with Jesus is not, am I happy, but it's, am I free? That's what really defines our walk with Christ. And the last main thing that I said last week was this, and, and, and we are reframing so much of, of elevation around this. I have reframed so much of my life around this one statement that loving well should be the goal of the Christian life. Loving well. Now, I'm an I'm a A-type, number eight Enneagram, D on the, on the disc profile leader that likes accomplishment. I like vision. I like taking territory. That shouldn't change, but it should be driven by a goal that is out of love and out of me wanting to love well. And in whatever we do should be creating an environment and a culture where we love one another well, we're loving Jesus well, and we're loving ourselves well. And so that for me has been probably one of the greatest revelations. I know it's, it's 101 to anyone else, but to me, I, I just see how much I had drifted and become more driven by accomplishments uh, externally rather than the revolution of internally coming to this place. So let's jump into John chapter 13 and let me read to you John chapter 13, verse 34. It says this. So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. You should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Again, we've all heard it preached. We've all heard it taught that what revealed Jesus to the community wasn't the facility. It wasn't how many Instagram followers we had. It was the way we treated other people. It's the way we genuinely loved one another. And I, I think, again, we so, so easily just skim over that. But when we understand that, that Jesus built his disciples around this principle. It's, it's, he taught so much on it and so many, if not all of the parables and stories in the, in the, in the Gospels are, are all about Jesus trying to usher his disciples into this new commandment, this new way of thinking about how we treat other people. You know, Jesus was a lot of things. Uh, uh, not just the Son of God, that's what he was best known as, but he was also the Messiah, which was the Christ, uh, uh, the, the, the King of Israel. But if you were a first century Jew and, and you were one day uh, going, uh, one Sabbath morning going to the synagogue and Jesus rocked up and started to speak, you would have seen him as a rabbi. A rabbi basically is a teacher, a teacher of Jesus was a teacher of the Torah, the writings of Moses, the, the Old Testament, uh, uh, early Old Testament and just the, the, the modern day or the old, old version of a Bible for what a Bible is for us today. Jesus would have been seen as a rabbi. In the Hebrew, a rabbi means teacher, basically. And every teacher had their band of followers, which they called disciples. And the thing is that in Jesus' day, there were multiple rabbis and multiple groups of disciples. But by simply watching a disciple, you could tell who their rabbi was. And so you could be walking down a street and you would hear the language of a disciple and you would know who the rabbi, their teacher was. And the question really echoes in my life, and I hope it does in yours, that by watching me or by watching you, can people tell who our teacher is? Like, do, do, we, do we act? Do we talk? Do we love in a way that actually points people to say, obviously, they're a follower of Jesus because of the way that they love and the way that they act? In the New Testament, the word Christian is used about three times. But the word disciple is actually used 268 times. And so this, this whole concept, which is not a new concept to many of us, it's the dominant language of, of a follower of Jesus Christ. 
And in Jesus' day, there were four things that a, a rabbi taught their disciple to do. So there were four responses that the, that the disciples had to have to follow a certain rabbi. Uh, number one, they memorized his words. So that was word for word. They, they, they got it down pat, memorizing the words of the rabbi. Number two, they adopted his interpretation of scripture. So his slant on things, they would abide in that. Number three, they imitated his ministry model. So the, the, the disciples were mini-me's of the rabbi. And number four, they multiplied his teaching in disciples of their own. With the whole idea that this thing that the rabbi was, was teaching would not just stay with his disciples, but it would then be passed on to their disciples. So with that in mind, I want us to jump into the book of Matthew, chapter 11. And I want to read to you a couple of verses that I think are so preached about. I have preached on these in multiple series over the years here at Elevation. But I've got to be honest here in 2020, I don't think I've ever really understood them. And I don't think I've ever really lived them. They, they fit well in a series when we're trying to encourage people to slow down and not hurry. But honestly, there's, there's so much more in this. So let me read to you from Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 to 30. It says this, Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. If the results we are currently getting are lousy in our faith and in our walk with Christ, if, if anxiety is still simmering, if there's mild depression, high loads of, uh, loads of stress, chronic emotional burnout and little or no sense of the presence of God in our life and inability to focus our mind on things and on scripture and things that make for life, then the odds are that something about the system that we are trying to operate in is broken. And when Jesus says here to take my yoke, you know, the yoke of the rabbi was, was reflected in, in the way they, it was their teaching on how to do life. It was their way of understanding humanity. So taking the yoke of the rabbi reflected a disciple's willing submission and adherence to his chosen rabbi's interpretation and application of the Old Testament scriptures. It was their teaching on how to be human. So the whole point of discipleship under Jesus is to model our life after Jesus. And Jesus says here that his yoke, his teachings on doing life well are light and they're easy. Now, I've got to be real honest. I don't know whether I've ever stayed long term in a theology of light and easy. Sooner or later, I find myself in a theology of work harder and achieve more. And I think humanity is, is always drifting that way. But what made Jesus different from other rabbis, apart from being the son of God, but was his teaching was, if you come to me, I'm actually going to lift the burden off you and you will find, and I love the way it says it, rest for your souls. I've said this bunches of times, but we live in a, in a society, in a world that, that does not know a theology on rest in our soul. We do not know it. We are fast paced. And even if we're not fast paced, our minds and our hearts and our emotions are in this adrenaline rush. The whole point of Jesus' model was to recover our soul to have that warped part of you and I put back to shape, to experience healing in the deepest parts of our being, to experience what Jesus called in John 10, 10, the full abundant life. So if we want to experience the life of Jesus, we have to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus and his discipleship mentality. So let me just share with the goal 
Three goals for us as Elevation Church. It's going to be part of our language, our new normal as we move forward in, in, in finding this recovery of our souls, this, this light and easy way of doing life that Jesus himself promised. Let me, let me read to you from Mark chapter 3, verse 14. It says this, And he, that's Jesus, went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might, three words, be with him. And he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. So number one is this, be with him. So this word discipleship, or in some versions, we'll say apprenticeship. And now I say apprenticeship because um, recently I spoke on, I, I did an apprenticeship as a structural engineer, was what we called it in Townsville. It's actually a boiler maker, but um, the structural engineer got the chicks. Structural engineer, um, uh, four years, lots of study, lots of, lots of work. And, you know, you, you, I, I had one tradesman for that whole four years that I, I worked with and watched the way that, that, that they did life. Well, when Jesus says, if you want to carry my easy yoke, if you want, if you want this, this burden that doesn't weigh you down, the number one to be my disciple, you've got to be with me. And so in Jesus' time, apprenticeship was 24-7. It wasn't like knock off at five, go home, download some Netflix and then come back the next day. You would follow your rabbi around from village to village, from synagogue to synagogue. You would spend every waking moment with him. You would eat three meals a day at their side. You would sleep by their side all day long. You know, there was a well-known Hebrew blessing in the first century that went like this. May you be covered in the dust of your rabbi. In other words, that you were so close to your rabbi that the dust from their feet walking village to village would cover your body. And here's the question. It's the one that I ask myself and, and am trying to set it up as a filter for my life. How am I going on the journey of being with Jesus? Now, I want you to, because some of the old mentality goes, well, I have a devotional time every morning, which is fantastic. Let me encourage you on that. But is that what discipleship means in being with? If a disciple was 24-7 with their rabbi, then a 15-minute, 30-minute devotional in the morning is fantastic. Please don't stop that. But it doesn't mean when we leave that, the apprenticeship stops. We're talking 24-7. So somewhere in the future of elevation, people, we've got, we've got to switch from my discipleship happens there to thinking this is a 24-7 journey. It's when I'm cycling with my buddies. It's when you're, you're at the shops. It's at, when you're at work, at university, at school. It's when you're at home with your three kids and there's pooey nappies. It's, discipleship is something that doesn't get put on the shelf at a certain time period. It's a 24-7 process. So being with Him. Let me ask you, you know, do we have moments during the day where we, we stop and we be with Him? that we center our heart, center our life back around Jesus. Because that's what a discipleship, apprenticeship journey actually looks like. Let me give you the second one. Let me read to you from Luke chapter 6 and verse 40. Luke 6 verse 40, it says this, Students are not greater than their teacher, but the student who is fully trained will become like the teacher. So the first thing is be with. The second thing is be like, be like him. Uh, being like Jesus, that's the goal. That was the goal of the disciples of the rabbi was to be like their rabbi. Every student, every apprentice of Jesus, the goal was to one day become like your teacher or your rabbi. That was the heart and soul of discipleship. It was all about becoming a literal carbon copy of your rabbi, a mini me. You would not only follow your rabbi around, you would copy their every single move. You would imitate his tone of voice, his dress, his mannerisms. It sounds like it sounds a little bit creepy to us today, but that's how it was. You wanted to be like him. 
So this thought of discipleship and apprenticeship to Jesus is about closing the gap of that one day. Uh, um, it's, it, it's, it's something that is just going to happen one day to understand this is a daily happening in our life of wanting to be like him. And this isn't you wanting to be like me. Thank you, Jesus. OK, this is you and me being like Jesus. There's a whole difference just in that, you know, the, the, the amount of energy that, that I've put in over all of my years of, of leadership, of trying to get people subscribing to a church philosophy before a Jesus philosophy. And it's exhausting because and, and, I know as soon as a better church starts up that it's their philosophy we, we run to. But when it's a Jesus philosophy, you're saying, you know what drives me is I want to be like my rabbi. I want to be like the one who called me to follow him. And what was Jesus most known for? He was most known for loving well and for, for loving the most undesirable people and the desirable, desirable people really, really well. So goal one is to be with Jesus. Goal two, to become like Jesus. Let me read again from Mark chapter 3, verse 14 for goal three. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those he desired, those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed the twelve. He also named apostles so that they might be with him and might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. So the third thing, do what he did. Be with him, be like him, and do what he did. Isn't that the goal of each and every one of us as followers of Christ to be like him, to be with him and to do what Jesus did. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, if you were privileged enough to be around in the 1990s, uh, in a small youth ministry in Michigan in the USA, a youth leader wanted to create a way for young people to keep themselves pure and almost like a decision making process to run all their decisions through. And so uh, this young lady came up with this term, what would Jesus do? And we know that this uh, swept the world. What would Jesus do? WWJD bracelets. Who had one of those bracelets? I didn't. You are embarrassing. Those who had one. Not really. Let me say, it, it, it swept the world. What would Jesus do? And we would, I, I used to preach it. You say, what would Jesus do? You're in the backseat of a car at the drive-in. Some of you don't know what a drive-in is. What would Jesus do if he was with his girlfriend? And it was really good and it changed lives and it was, it was impactful for the time. But, but there's only one thing I would have added to that. And this isn't my own. This comes from a book called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry by John Mark Comer. He said this, and I want you to get this. This is really revolutionary. Jesus was a first century male, single Jewish rabbi, not a 21st century parent, not a 21st century account manager, student, pastor, company executive. So we have to ideate and transpose a bit. So I shouldn't ask, what would Jesus do? But ask this, what would Jesus do if he was me? You know, when I read that recently and I shared it with Kathy, it was like a aha, wow moment. What would Jesus do as a white male, 55 year old father, grandfather? What would Jesus do if he were me? You know what I reckon he'd do? I reckon he'd spend a lot of time with his grandkids. I reckon he would have a little tinny and put his grandkids in and take them out fishing. I reckon that he would look after his children and love on his children. I think he would do life well with his wife. I think he would love on people around him as a father should. So think about this for you. You're a, you're a 30 year old mum and you've got three kids and they're, you know, you're driving you crazy. Your husband's at work. One thing to say, what would Jesus do? But what would Jesus do if he was a 30 year old mum with three kids? It, it kind of changes the whole filter from understanding that we are a 21st century disciple, follower of Christ. It's freeing. You know what it is? It, it, it's actually the yoke that is light that says, what would Jesus do if he was me? You know what? I reckon Jesus would sit down and watch the wiggles with my kids because I reckon that's the way Jesus was. It lifts the burden of us feeling like we've got to be this perfect person and try and fit a mold and a model that is exhausting so many of us. So what did Jesus do through the Gospels? He taught the way. 
He healed the sick. He cast out, he cast out demons. He did justice. He ate and drank with people who were way far from God. He prayed. He prophesied. He stood up against religious hypocrisy and pride. He spoke into the life of political power. And when you read through that, that's basically what Jesus did. And if we're an apprentice of Jesus, a disciple of Jesus, then that's what we get to do as a 55 year old man living on the Gold Coast with a daughter and a son and grandchildren. That's what I get to do. The context may change, but the mission still remains. And I love that about Jesus. You know, as we come to a close, um, I want to make an opportunity for anyone here today. And you've never become an apprentice, a follower of Christ. You've never become a disciple. Maybe you've been turned off by some of the disciples. I've been turned off by some of the disciples. I mean, there's some wacky Christians out there. But remember, Christians only used three times in the Bible. A follower of Christ, a disciple, uh, an apprentice is used 268 times. And so what does it mean to be a follower of Christ? Jesus said this in Mark chapter 8, verse 34. Really, really simple. And calling to the crowd, that's us, with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. You know, it all starts a following Jesus, a discipleship by our rabbi, our teacher Jesus, all starts with a simple place of surrender. By saying, God, I've messed my life up. I've screwed my life up. I've got the consequences I'm dealing with right now. I give it to you. That's where this journey starts. And I'm hoping today that right throughout Elevation Online, that maybe there's some people here today and you've given up on your discipleship journey. Maybe you had a really unhealthy pastor, a really unhealthy life group leader, youth leader that turned you off. Some stuff went down, stuff hit the fan. I get it. But don't let that stop you in your journey of following Christ and becoming more like Him, being with Him and doing what He did. And so I'm going to pray right now and I'm going to pray a really simple prayer. And if you say, you know what, I think I can do that denying myself, taking up my cross and following. It's surrender. It's just saying, God, I, I don't have the answers. I think I can do that much. Then that's where the journey starts. I want to pray with you today. Father, for every person that finds themselves wanting to start a journey with Jesus. Lord, we come to this place of surrender right now. We give you our life, every mistake, every bit of shame, every bit of guilt, all the religious jargon. I surrender it to you right now. And I ask, can I follow you? Here I am. Help me to become one of your disciples from this moment forward. Amen. Now, just as we close with that, and if you did say that prayer and you meant it, you know, online, there's an opportunity. You can press one of the tabs down below that said, you know, I want to raise my hand and accept Jesus. You can e email us, um, elevationchurch.com.au, uh, bunches of ways that you, you can talk right now on the, on the online chat about what it means to become a follower of Christ. Would you give me just, just two, two more minutes to, to wrap this up? Because I want to read you that verse again in Matthew chapter 11. I want to read it to you if I can from the Message Bible. Uh, I don't use the Message Bible a lot, but every now and then there's a, a couple of verses that just really kind of expands a little bit and allows it just to resonate a bit more. And what I want to do, I want to slow it down a little bit and allow this to soak into you as you abide in it. This is Jesus speaking. You ready? Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Are you tired? Worn out? Are you burnt out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. It's my prayer for each and every one of us today that we'd learn to live freely 
and lightly. God bless you. Well, what an incredible message from our lead pastor, Ross Abraham. And was anybody else guilty of having one of those little WWJD vans? I know I had one in high school. It was purple with white writing. But what a great way to think of that question. What would Jesus do if he was me? And I pray that you'll think about that question this week, that you'll meditate on it. And I pray that you'll keep reading those scriptures that he read at the end and just let them sink into your spirit. And if you made a decision to follow Jesus, we are excited for you and we want to celebrate with you. So as Ross said, there's so many ways you can let us know. You can fill out a red card on our website or right there in the chat, you can click the raise my hand button or you can select live prayer, whatever way you want to do it. We want to celebrate you. We want to pray with you and we want to walk this journey with you. So please let us know. And we hope you'll come back next week for another service with Elevation Online. Bye.